Well, good morning. Good morning. Give me a second to move furniture. I didn't move furniture. You know what? Is that things have not uh, things have been challenging, right? But just when you think things couldn't get any worse, we read about things like this. Ta-da! We learn that Lego has introduced a sharper brick that instantly kills you when it's stepped upon. Let me, let me read the article. This is an article. Are you ready? Yes. Just the way, just what you came to church to hear, right? Bad news. Lego introduced a new sharper brick that wants to kill, kill you when you step upon it. Out of Denmark, Lego has just introduced new and improved interlocking plastic bricks that will instantly kill you when you step on them. Sources at the company headquarters confirm, confirm Thursday. <laughs> the sharper, those were nervous laughs, by the way, that I just heard. I just heard a few laughs, but they're very nervous laughs. The sharper edges in this new design will just immediately put you out of your misery so you don't have to roll around on the ground in excruciating pain for minutes on end. Utilizing advanced laser-driven technology and techniques, Lego factories can now hone the edges of the famously sharp and painful bricks to such a fine point that the human nervous system instantly shuts down upon coming into contact with them. And the article goes from there. How many of you have stepped on a Lego brick and thought you were going to die? Right? And so it, just when you thought it was bad, it got worse. Legos, they're fun for the entire family, ages 4 to 99, so they say, right? 4 to 99. It was started in the 1930s. Legos were, I'm going to put my, I have a Lego right here. I'm going to set it right here. Can everyone see that? Started in 1930, or in the 1930s, it's almost 100 years old that Legos have been around. A lot of fun. Some of the kits are, 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 um, that you can buy run about 20, the average price is like $25 to $50 for these, but they can run in the hundreds of dollars for these, for these kits. In fact, some of the collectible uh, items, you can Google me on this and check it out, Is it because I already did, so you're good. Some of the more expensive, th like the most expensive Lego sets are four to seven thousand dollars for the set just a collector kit like a kit so not not a whole store of legos <laughs> but a whole just a kit four to seven thousand dollars but you can go and buy and many of you have bought these and some some of you bought them for christmas for your children already but they're very simple kind of blocks that that interlock with one another and secure and they're they're small blocks that you you put together to serve a greater purpose and sometimes some pretty big things kind of like these right here the largest kit that you can buy is a coliseum ta-da there you go the largest kit get this kids are you watching are you drooling I am when I saw these. This is incredible. The, now, this isn't the exact one, but there is a Colosseum that they sell, which is the largest Lego kit that is available, the Colosseum, and it is, um, it's over 9,000 pieces. This guy went above and beyond and built that one. This one is, sets the world record for the largest Lego ship ever made. Who wants that? Oh, yeah. I didn't even get through the question, and some of you had already uh, jumped on that. So, the, the blocks are more valuable than just by themselves, and so much more than when you step on them. That was a fake article, by the way. It, it appeared, but it's Babylon B. So, before some of you, I had to clarify, some of you were going to go check that out. And you're like, oh, no. But uh, I, wa I want you to do this. For the remainder of the sermon, uh, I'd like you to do something for me. At the end of every row, there's a cup. And I'd like you to grab that cup and everyone take one single 
kids, kids and adults, one single, this isn't your time to, to build from several, share. Take one single block, Lego block, Make sure everyone has a Lego block in their hand. Did you get one, Greg? Yeah, throw Greg a nice color. The creation of every block is purposeful and intentional. Every block. The design, they're designed to perfectly and uniquely fit into other blocks, forming a tight bond. Creating something greater than itself, like a community, like a community. Each one of us, we're gonna talk today about the truth about community. Each one of us serve in this community as a block. We may look at the pictures before and think, wow, that's, that's huge, but none of those we're able to be formed without a single block, single blocks gathering together for intentionality. You and I were created for community. Community is God's chosen vehicle for meaningful connections, resulting in greater impact on the world around us. That's the truth about community. Hold on to your Lego block. Your Lego block is going to symbolize our conversation, our about community today. I really appreciate that we've spent, during this series, we've spent a little bit bit of time in this letter written by Paul to the church Philippi. A group of Christians, Philippians, uh, they were called Philippians. It's the letter, for us it's Philippians. But what I want to do is take us to the very beginning of that letter, where Paul begins the conversation. And I'm going to read out of Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, You can turn in your own device or in your own scripture there, and you're going to see just highlights on the slides above because it's a, it's there's a little bit more than what, uh, what you can fit in in slides, and so you'll see the highlights though. But I want to read this to you, and you could follow along. I'm going to read the English Standard Version. It goes like this: Paul Paul is writing. He opens up this letter saying, "I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer." of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. Do you hear his heart? And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. Paul, can you imagine if you received this letter from this man that you admire, this person that you admire, you'd heard about all his work, he's in prison now for the work that he's done for the gospel, for Jesus' work. He's in prison and he writes back to you in your your church And he shares with you these heartfelt words before he even says anything else, before he unpacks everything else that he does within the letter. He does this sort of greeting. This is a community-based, community-focused greeting. He talks about the value and the worth and the substance of community. And that's what I want us to walk through within these these few verses here about what Paul's perspective on community, the truth about community, and then what we can pull from this as well, how we all fit together. First, the definition, though. When you hear community, 
oftentimes you think, well, my community is my, my neighborhood. It's, it's, uh, it's my development. It's my, my town, my hometown. Uh, I want us to make sure that we, we're clear that let's, let's look a little more micro, a little smaller, a little more focused. Y- yes, you live in a community. Even those that are in the country live in the country. You have a community that you live in. But I'm talking about community where you actually connect relationally with people on an ongoing basis. So for our purposes today, for our conversation, the truth about community must be the truth about us in this community, this gathering here, and all who touch and connect with us here as a, you could say, as a church community, those that you connect with. So that's, as we walk through this, that's who Paul is talking to here. Paul is talking to a gathered community. Second thing that we have to observe when we walk through Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, in fact, the whole whole letter that he writes here, but this is an important fact, important thing to capture, and that is, Paul, oftentimes we will read scripture, we'll read the Bible, and we'll read everything through a lens of me as an individual. Oh, this specific verse is about me. I need to do this. This is, this is about personal or individualized growth and process, and the answer is yes, but Paul is writing specifically to a collective group, and much of Scripture needs to be read in such a way. In this, in Philippians, it's read as a a group. Now, let's capture a couple things here that that really emphasize. This is important for the truth of community. He says things like this as he walks through uh, 3 through 11. He says things uh, like, uh, you all, multiple times. He he refers to that, that word of um, I, I yearn to be with you all in affection. This is for you all. And that's his way of saying that you as a collective group. Now, this is important because as we think about community, yes, we think about our reaction to community, but community is not singularly about us. Community is not there to serve us, but we are there to engage the community at large. So the first thing that I, I capture from this passage, the first truth from this passage about community that I capture is that community is valuable. Seems pretty simple, but I would add to that that it's, community needs to be valued because it's valued by God. Community is valued by God. Let's look way back at the very beginning. In Genesis, you see these relationships even throughout the whole Old Testament. But even in the very beginning, you read the, uh, the whole book of Genesis, you see this, the idea that when God communicated, he did work through an individual, but he spoke of community. The vision, the promise that God kept going through over and over again was about a promise for a larger community that connected together in him. Um, and oftentimes it's this multicultural, diverse group that gathered together, and he kept promising over and over again, it's about community, it's about gathering together. We see this once again when the early part of the church, when the church was birthed in Acts chapter 2 and, t- and chapter 4. This is really cool that I, I have to read this to you. And so it's when after the Jesus... Uh, is uh, dead, buried, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven. He gave, uh, he gave uh, his, the marching orders to the disciples about going forward, and then the church was birthed and formed. And that's Acts chapter 2, but then uh, Acts chapter 2 and then chapter 4, there are these couple times about what it looked like when the church first started, when the people of God began being a community in the first place. And this is, this is really cool. And so it, it says in it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 23 through uh, 31, it talks about this prayer for boldness that the disciples had. So the community came together and said, we pray, God, that you will use us in mighty ways. And then, boom, what happens right after that? Verse 32 on, it says this, now the full member of those who believe were one, this is a description of the community, those who believed were one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to them 
was their own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and a great grace was upon them. And there was no needy person among them. For as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each in need. And so what happened was there's this sharing in common. And so many more things happened as a result of this community. And that's the context that, that Paul is writing here about the truth about community. He's saying each one of you play a role in the overall community. Do something greater than you could do by yourself. And that's the intention. That's why we were created. Invest in what you value. Invest in what you value. What is the value that you have placed on community? Can I encourage you this day to to look at your immediate community, the, and speaking of the, the church, your new start community is, is what we're going to use as a base. What value do you place upon it? That would lead to the second item that I think Paul points out, and that he points out that you cultivate what you value. So cultivating community. So verse 5 and verse 7 you the, use these two words particularly. He uses the word partnership and partakers. He, those are words of cultivation. Those are words about working at a connection with one another for greater impact. That, verse 9, your love may abound more and more. This is hard work. This is important work. But it's fruitful and fulfilling work. To cultivate community means to recognize the challenges that we face in community, in relationship one with another. Let's, let's not be naive. Let's not be naive and believe for one minute that just because we're gathered together as a church, that you gather together with people that believe, have faith in Christ, that all of a sudden that you're going to, everyone's get along, going to get along perfectly. The nature of who we are, we're going to be challenged in a relationship one with another. There are going to be some sharp edges, right? Sometimes it's going to feel like you ever play with your Lego, play with your Legos. It's like, don't deny that you've played with Legos, okay? But if you ever played with Legos and you feel like you can't quite get it to fit, you can't quite get one piece into the other, it feels like it's a forced connection. But then maybe there's just an adjustment that needs to be made for it to be able to fit together. Relationships are tough at times. It's well worth the work to cultivate healthy relationships one with another. Boy, if there's any a place for this to happen, it's, it's your community, your opportunity your opportunity to push through the challenges that are inevitable. They're going to happen. We're going to say things, do things that are going to offend, that are going to be hurtful. And it's finding a way to cultivate that community when things are less than perfect. They're never going to be perfect. But it's well worth the cultivation. I believe that's what Paul believed here. In fact, later in his letter, he shared as much when he encouraged and he named specific names. Encourage, encourage these two people to work through their challenge, their relational challenge with one another. It will all be worth it. He's calling out names, encouraging them to build relationship that is healthy with one another. Furthermore, in Philippians chapter 2, I love this, is that um, any time that we can visit Philippians 2, uh, 1 through 11, but I'll hit the first couple verses, this is a fabulous passage here. Paul writes the same group, talking about community and cultivating community. He said, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy 
by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and in one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also the interest of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. How cool is that? The encouragement to cultivate community. The final thing that I see Paul pointing out in verses 3 through 11 here has to do with engaging community. It's about engaging wisely and deliberately with community for greater impact on the world around you. He says this throughout when he mentions the, mentions the gospel. Uh, I, once again, verse 3, 4 on, he starts from the very beginning. He's He's saying, because of your partnership in the gospel, verse 5, it's all about the greater cause that we work together forward, forwards towards. It requires shifting some of our previous views of sometimes self-importance. There are no lone bricks. Lone bricks do what? They get stepped on. And it hurts. Now, you aren't literally going to be stepped on if you're a loner. But we know and recognize that in community, we were meant to connect with one another. There are six, eight, whatever holes and buttons on every brick for a reason. Whatever number that is there, there's a purpose for that, to be able to connect with one another. But it, it requires shifting our understanding from what we can get out of things to what can we do for community and how can we connect. It's seeing the world with fresh eyes. As Jesus saw the world, in Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, it says that he looked out on the masses. He was, he was out, out about doing his father's business. He was preaching and teaching, healing, and it says that he looked out and he saw the people like they were sheep without a shepherd. And he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them. It's a different view when you engage community. And what did he say right away? He turned to his disciples. When he had compassion, he saw people for who they were, how, how, um, how we are to see them as well. And he turned to his disciples and he said, Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he'll send workers into the harvest field, engaging into the broader community. It is gospel-centered. Community, the truth about community is that it's gospel-centered, meaning that reconciling all things to him and with one another once again, verse 5 and verse 7 talks about being partners and partakers, but partners in what? The gospel. Partakers in what? Grace. It's about the cause greater than ourself, which is the gospel. It's about connecting with one another in community so we can form something greater together. Now, this last week, um, many of us received, and you may have received this, a uh, a letter in the mail from New Start. I loved this letter. If you aren't on the list, get your, get your name in. But here's what I loved about this letter. Fifteen of the cool things that happened in 2020. Sound familiar? Let me go over some of these. I got so excited getting this letter, I, I have to read it this morning. 15 cool things that happened in 2020. Let's hit some of the highlights, or some of the things. They're all highlights. There are many good things that happened, but some of the things that I'll, I'll bring up is 18 people, the, number one, 18 people placed their faith and trust in Jesus during one of our worship services, and we baptized eight people. Yeah. That, that's awesome. That is gospel. That is grace. 
That is work of reconciliation. That is what we are to be about. New Start volunteers provided and served 320 meals to under-resourced people through the community. That is good, good work. That's gospel work. Individuals were serving other individuals who may not have been able to do things on their own. 191st time guests. Although we had folks that came down with COVID-19, there was no spread throughout New Start in 2020. For our Christmas offering, we raised $12,129. This went to Compassion Ministry in Guatemala and existing ministry in Delaware County. Now what this translates into are 78 families, 78 families in Guatemala have water tanks and filtration. That is gospel work. That is grace work. That is work of reconciliation that a single brick cannot accomplish on their own. Let me go on. I don't even know if I have time. I'm going to keep going because this is awesome. (laughs) We served 124,800 pounds of groceries and produce to 2,860 households through our partnership with Ohio Food Bank and Andrew's House. That's gospel work. That's grace work. That's work of reconciliation. 34 teens participated in a spiritual growth a camping retreat. Multiple people who have never attended New Start have become and participated in our compassion ministries. Over 20 new volunteers in children's ministry, and that's growing as the day goes. 38 marriages were coached, counseled, and encouraged through our marriage ministry and pastoral team. Those are changed, that's personal, right? It's an area that I help oversee. And 38 marriages, 38 family trees. How many children are represented that because mom and dad were able to see reconciliation, hope, healing, start off well, push through and endure and uh, uh, see reconciliation through crisis. How many children are represented because mom and dad were able to have a marriage that's healed and whole? I skipped the one about volleyball. How could I do that? (laughs) Volleyball is rocking it. Pickleball, walkers. We have multiple ministries through sports ministry. And I'll tell you what, volleyball is a great example of this brick not able to go on their own. That is a team of people doing gospel work, reconciliation ministry, one with another. And then finally, I'll remind us what the letter reminds us. And that is, you, I, are part of this because of financial contribution. So everything's undergirded by generosity, financially, Um, of time, resources, in order to pull off this work. Partnership, partakers together. Legos, placed together to do something greater than what we can do separate. That is the truth about community. So my question I leave with you today is, these are the 15 cool things that happened in 2020, but what are the 15 cool things or more that will happen in 2021 because we are community one with another, because we value community, because we cultivate community, because we engage in community one with another. What more, what more can can happen? What great coliseum can be built or great uh, cruise ship can be built? Or, let's make sure we cover this, what even, smaller project of great import can be built. 
It doesn't have to be the largest world-breaking Lego creation ever. But some of us, many of us, most of us will do things because we value and cultivate and engage in community. We will do great things for God that seem small to us, but they're great things for God. Will you, with me, join in community? Join in community with one another. Seek healthy relationships. Seek opportunities to serve and be engaged and involved. If you call New Start home, if you're connected to New Start at all, and you are not engaged yet, may 2021 be a chance, an opportunity the time that you connect your Lego with another Lego for a cause, for an effort that's greater than yourself individually. Let's worship together.